Ladies and gentlemen, this is the program on constitutional government at Harvard in the Department of Government. And uh, our meeting today is with Suzanne Nielsen. Suzanne Nielsen is a professor of political science and she's the head of the social science department as a whole at the United States Military Academy that is at uh, West Point. And uh, she can't tell this because she's not in uniform but she's a colonel in the United States Army. She got her BS from West Point and she got her PhD from the Harvard Government Department. And she's the author of several books, most recently, The American National, American National Security in 2018. Uh, she's going to talk on civil military relations, but she's indicated that she'll take up any most any questions that are put, and, 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 and including those about West Point as a, as a college. Um, she's speaking today from West Point on the eve of the Army-Navy game, which is tomorrow and Saturday, uh, and is going to be held at West Point. So we should all be singing on brave old Army team. So Suzanne Nielsen, Colonel Nielsen. Thank you so much, uh, Harvey. I appreciate it. Uh, it really is a pleasure to be back with the Harvard community, uh, even if it's only uh, virtually. Uh, I am remain grateful deeply to several people on this call for the experience that I had uh, as a graduate student at Harvard University. And um, that education has uh, really been uh, the basis on which to, to continue to grow and to, to learn and to contribute. And um, you know, I remain extremely grateful to be part of the community. Uh, before I, I get too far along, I would just like to clarify that the, the remarks I'm going to make today are, are really my own personal opinion and should not be uh, thought to be the opinion of the military academy, uh, the army, or the Department of Defense. And uh, what I'm, I'm going to do to begin today's session is draw on a, on a few ideas from an article that my uh, colleague at, in, in my department, uh, Professor Hugh Liebert, who's also on this call, and I co-wrote uh, recently on American Civil Military Relations. I think some of you may have seen it, but I only sent it yesterday. So I'll just uh, give sort of an overview of that article. And then um, I look forward to the conversation uh, afterwards on that or on anything else that's on your minds. Uh, the start point for our article was really the idea that in military operations since 9-11, uh, to include places like Afghanistan and Iraq and Libya, uh, the United States has really experienced uh, less than optimal results, arguably paid uh, too high a price for too great a period of time uh, for too little uh, results. And uh, our, our question is why, what can account for that? How should we think about that? And the truth is that we, uh, that it's very easy to acknowledge that these less than optimal results are arguably the product of many, many factors. And some of these uh, include Really, the goals of these military operations were always intrinsically difficult. I think it's long been recognized that it's more difficult to bring order to a place that's inadequately governed and lacks legitimate governance than it is to defeat uh, conventional adversaries. In addition, there's just a whole array of factors at every level that contribute to the strategic outcomes the United States has seen uh, since 9-11 uh, to include the decisions of the country's political leaders, the operations of our uh, interagency, uh, as well as uh, the operations of other departments and agencies across the US government, uh, as well as our partners. But I think it's also uh, inevitably true that some of these shortcomings lie within the armed forces uh, themselves. And this uh, potential uh, weakness, the source of failure, uh, is a legitimate reason to want to see the US Armed Forces, the services, uh, engage in some introspection about those results. And so really what we do in our article is start from that and, and argue that to guide this introspection, it would be worthwhile to return to some of the classic works of American civil military relations and to think about some of what their core arguments uh, have to offer us in this endeavor. Uh, for, for really, uh, six decades now, uh, since 1957 at least, there have been really two fundamental touchstones in the field that are almost inevitably uh, referenced when talking about American civil military relations. 
And of course, that's The Soldier in the State by Samuel Huntington, published in 1957. And Moros Janowitz is the professional soldier, uh, published just three years later in 1960. And it's really the basic framework from the soldier in the state that's held sway uh, over thinking, particularly within the armed forces about American civil military relations. And so our, argu our argument really is that Morris Genowitz is the professional soldier actually deserves greater uh, emphasis and attention. The reason that we argue that is that, that the professional soldier is really stronger in articulating the need for political awareness in the officer corps placing more emphasis on the need for officers to understand the political impact of military posture at home and around the world, as well as the political impact of military operations. So I'll just uh, proceed with this argument in, in four parts uh, before wrapping up. And the first, I just wanna just touch on this idea of strategic success. So my start point uh, inevitably, and perhaps I can uh, blame the chair of my dissertation committee, Steve Rosen for this, uh, but my start point is really still always uh, Karl von Clausewitz's On War. It's certainly a very imperfect and unfinished work, but uh, there is one point that I think it is unsurpassed in military theory, and that's the clarity and the value of its logic on the relationship between uh, military means and political ends. Uh, to see this, you need merely recall Clausewitz's famous formulation that war is merely the continuation of policy by other means. He goes on to say, the political object is the goal, war is the means of reaching it, and means can never be considered in isolation from their purpose. So stated another way, the value of military means is inseparable uh, from their contribution to a more politically desirable uh, end state or state of affairs. Clausewitz also makes clear that the greatest demands on military judgment are felt by the most uh, senior commander in a theater of war. He writes, on that on that level, strategy and policy coalesce. The commander in chief is simultaneously a statesman. So it follows that the United States would benefit from having senior military leaders who are aware of the political ramifications of their presence, action or inaction, and who are inclined to recognize that the success or failure to advance the national interest will ultimately be judged in political terms. So moving on to, uh, the merits and the weaknesses potentially of the soldier in the state. You know, I think it's it's relatively rare that a work of political science has as much weight uh, 60 years after it was originally published, um, or at least modern political science as the soldier in the state does. Uh, really still, as I had mentioned previously, an inevitable touchstone in the field. And I think there's good reasons why it was influential. First of all, at the time that it was published, it it spoke to some of the most significant and salient, salient concerns uh, that pertain to US national security in the time of the Cold War. It identified the military as a profession, which was a status that was inevitably attractive to those in uniform. And it developed a formula for civilian control, objective control, under which the military would remain a politically neutral profession, loyal to whomever obtained legitimate political authority, but with the autonomy to develop its expertise in the management of violence uh, according to its own uh, terms. In sum, basically, Huntington said that Americans could have their national security and have liberalism as well if they could approximate what he called objective control. However, when he articulated the solution, Huntington stressed the division of labor between the statesman and the soldier. Huntington's military officer spoke only of managing violence, the statesman spoke only of political objectives. The tricky business of linking the one to the other, in short, the work uh, of strategy, was left without a leading voice. So in contrast, let me turn now quickly to Janowitz as the professional soldier. Like Huntington's A Soldier in the State, Janowitz as the professional soldier was written in the context of the Cold War. However, while the strategic context was similar, their concerns are very different. Samuel Huntington was really most concerned about whether the liberal democracy that was the United States of America could, in the context of its liberalism and a long, intense standoff of the Soviet Union, adequately provide for its own national security. Uh, to achieve that, he recommended a three-part solution, a politically neutral and powerless military, professional military autonomy and development of its expertise, 
and also a degree of cultural isolation of the military from the broader society. While Janowitz saw a strategy of containment, uh, saw that a strategy of containment, containment would similarly require a large force in being, he argued for integration rather than separation. When military confrontation could escalate to nuclear annihilation, he argued the country would need its officer corps to become a constabulary force, continuously prepared to act, committed to a minimum use of force. In other words, a military that seeks viable international relations rather than victory because it has incorporated a protective military posture. The most significant advantage of Janowitz's constabulary concept when compared to Huntington's ideal of an autonomous professional military is its emphasis on the idea that officers require political awareness in order to serve the national interest most effectively. Military institutions have a political impact in times of peace and in times of war, and through their posture as well as through their actions. So Janowitz sets out three dilemmas in particular that military leaders should help the country's political leaders to address. Uh, and these include uh, the political as well as the military implications of force structures. Uh, and here I would emphasize the diplomatic and strategic uh, implications of force structure and posture as well as the technical military implications, uh, the relative advantages and disadvantages of non-military as well as military approaches to international security challenges, and international security issues with a military dimension that do not involve the use of force, such as arms control. 14 years after the professional soldier, Janowitz extended the work's analysis of the strategic environment uh, arguing that the application of force is not a periodic all or nothing event, but a continuous aspect of the social process, which must be moderated in terms of self-interest and recognition of the unanticipated consequences of the use of force. Um, so let me just turn briefly to uh, implications for military education. Sammy Huntington did advocate for a broad general education for officers and then a technical phase that did not explicitly include a sensitivity toward political implications. Janowitz agreed that technical, technical and, and technical competence of the officer corps at its war fighting tasks is necessary. However, he argued, military officers should also understand politics. Uh, in fact, uh, just quoting a, a passage here, he said, officer education in political military affairs should start in the military academy where tactical training must be related to the requirements of international relations and continue at higher levels of education and professional experience. Uh, so let me, uh, in conclusion, um, return to the, the remarks that I opened this with, which is really a call for introspection. Why have recent US military operations not produced a more satisfactory degree of strategic success? As acknowledged above, I think the, the reasons for this are uh, complex and multidimensional, and many of them have nothing at all to do with the education of the officer corps. However, to the extent that the military uh, played a role in the country's failure to secure more favorable political outcomes at a lower cost, it does seem useful to ask questions like the following. Is the military too focused on achieving tactical and operational success and not focused enough on helping the country's political leaders develop and implement national security policies that will produce strategic success. Are today's senior military leaders adequately prepared to help the country's uh, political leaders examine the full array of policy options and to assist them in advancing the national interest through means other than the use of force? In my view, the, the, the quick comeback to this is always that uh, that technical competence must come first for the officer corps. But I think it's false to say that those two things must inevitably come at the expense of one another, that one is only technically competent or politically aware. I think neither is alone is sufficient uh, and both are necessary and the services can do both. So in conclusion, let me just uh, uh, sum up with our argument that 21st century military officers can and should be excellent tacticians and astute observers of political affairs. Uh, and that in its call for officers to have these attributes, that uh, the professional soldier deserves uh, renewed attention in the officer development programs of, of the US Armed Services. 
Uh, so with that, um, and you know, Hugh can uh, testify to any damage I did to our argument. Uh, let me, I'd, I'd love to open it up and, and hear what's on people's mind, minds. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Suzanne. Uh, let me just insert a remark which shows the wisdom of academic departments. Sam Huntington wrote that famous and very uh, influential book of his as an assistant professor at Harvard. And after he finished it and published it, he was not given tenure right away, but rather he was sent, uh, as it were, from a major league team to its farm team from Harvard to Columbia. This is very unfair to Columbia, but still I'll say it. Uh, for, uh, <laughs> for further work and development. <laughs> and it was only uh, uh, two or three years later that, uh, uh, that he was invited back to Harvard for, <laughs> with a, for a tenure uh, appointment. So, um, well, uh, and, 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 yet, uh, and, this, and yet this is very, a very powerful book. He wrote a number of uh, powerful books in his time. All of them, I would suggest with uh, flaws, but still, <laughs> Um, very, uh, very successful, very successful. So I'm, uh, I'm going to um, put, uh, since I think there are a lot of people here with good questions, I'm going to uh, let, let them go ahead. Uh, Steve, please. Steve Rosen. Thank you, Aya. Uh, Suzanne, I, uh, thank you for a, a, a brilliant paper and a, and a clear and powerful exposition. Uh, <laughs> I fundamentally agree with you that uh, a, an understanding of politics ought to, to be part of the education of officers. And I agree with you in your respectful but serious critique of Sam Huntington's book, which I share, Harvey is right, Sam's books were powerful, uh, but often had central flaws. Uh, Huntington's book appealed to the uh, officer corps of the United States because basically it said, civilians sh should leave them alone. Uh, they should be free to develop their professional expertise and, and not have civilians meddle in, in their activities. That would be subjective control, and that's bad. Uh, but it's, it's arguable that the failures that we saw in recent conflicts were the result of too little uh, civilian intervention in military affairs. Uh, I don't think I'm saying anything uh, unfair or untrue when I say that the United States Army uh, didn't like counterinsurgency in the Vietnam War and didn't like nation building in, in the Iraq War, but that's, those were the tasks that were necessary. And it was the responsibility of the civilians to ensure that the military instrument was used for the political purposes of the state so that the military would do things that it found uncomfortable or difficult because uh, of its professional preferences, uh, but didn't do it. So couldn't your argument be flipped around? It's not only that military officers should be given education to help them understand the political effects of their military actions. Uh, shouldn't we be giving civilians more education in military affairs so that they can understand how to uh, they can understand the logic of military operations so as to make military operations uh, supportive uh, of, their, uh, of their political objectives. To quote Clausewitz again, after you did, uh, Clausewitz says, uh, the political leaders uh, should direct the war, but they might often make mistakes in how they do it because they don't properly understand its language. Just as a person speaking a foreign language may not express himself properly because he doesn't understand the language in which he is speaking. Uh, I, I make this point, Suzanne, because uh, as you are more familiar than I do, the military has been growing in influence in American national security affairs, not receding. The Joint Staff is not all powerful in the Pentagon, but it is much more powerful than people uh, anticipated at its beginning. And it's because partly of the strength of the Joint Staff, but also the weakness of the civilian staff of the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Are you, are you not worried that by strengthening the officer corps by making it intellectually more powerful without also strengthening the civilian side, 
uh, of the decision-making process that you might help inadvertently produce what Sam was trying to stop uh, by writing the book, uh, which was the undue influence of people like Douglas MacArthur, who clearly had his own political vision uh, and his own understanding of how military means could be used to bring about political outcomes. Harvey, you mentioned that Sam was not initially given tenure, and that was because Carl Friedrich said he had not left Germany to promote to a tenured position uh, a professor who defended militarism. Uh, uh, you know, civilians uh, don't like studying military affairs and don't often understand it, but the fear of militarism and the fear of military, uh, undue military influence in politics is, is, not a, is not a frivolous fear. So again, my main point is, don't you, uh, would, would you agree that while officers should be given more political education, civilians should be given more military education? Thank you for allowing me to go on longer than I should have. No, I, uh, I think there are so many great points there and um, I completely agree with your bottom line. You know, I would say that it's always tempting for those of us, particularly those of us in uniform to first and foremost, focus on what can be done institutionally on the military side of the equation, only because it's so much easier to understand how we might achieve it. Uh, because we have institutions that have systems of education and training, and we know what the population is. It's an institution that doesn't allow lateral entity. So we're going to have the senior leaders, what we start producing uh, at the pre-commissioning level. On the civilian side, uh, hopefully, there'll be a much a broader and more diverse array of types of talents that come to exercise civilian control in the country. So I think one of the reasons we tend to focus on that last is only because it's almost a harder challenge because it's a more diffuse population and the leaders can come from so many uh, valuable walks of life. Um, but I do wanna you know, take up your point on the really critical importance of strong civilian leadership. So, you know, we, um, we recently hosted Secretary Gates for a guest lecture. And one of the questions he was asked in our faculty seminar was about whether, whether he was concerned about uh, the precedent for civil military relations of so many uh, uh, previous uh, military leaders in a president's cabinet. Um, he actually answered by saying that, that one of his greater concerns was uh, frankly, the lack of uh, civilian leadership in DOD that was created by the fact that, and I just saw a headline that about 40% right now of the senior civilian positions in the Department of Defense are not filled with confirmed appointments. And so that lack of investment in strong civilian oversight within the DOD, I think is, uh, is of great uh, concern and a worry. It could produce bad habits. It's also not, you know, uh, one way of attacking this is through education. And I think things that uh, you, know, you yourself have been involved in, and not only the courses that you teach, but in supporting initiatives like SWAMOS to help to produce that civilian expertise is important. But I think experience is also important. And our future Secretary of Defense is probably, well, hopefully at some point gonna have some other types of experiences, maybe at the Assistant Secretary level or in OSD or some time in the Pentagon, I think would be sort of an ideal civilian grooming pathway for future Secretary of Defense. So um, I, I pretty much see the point. I think that what we ought to be concerned about is uh, strong civilian control, but I don't necessarily agree with the premise that strengthening the military partner to the partnership uh, necessarily comes at that expense. I think that those are both important uh, parallel uh, areas of emphasis. Um, and I guess I just wouldn't let the military off the hook for, um, you know, uh, for the fact that as a learned organizational vulnerability after Vietnam, when the country we focused on Europe and the challenge of the Soviet Union after the Vietnam War, the services rushed to uh, be part of that uh, because it also was something that they wanted to do. The fact that the services did not go back to an examination of those problems, I think was a, a failure of, uh, of, of the responsibility of the services to be prepared for what they might be asked by political leaders uh, to do. So I just wouldn't uh, completely let them off the hook. 
Um, and since we're quoting Clausewitz, there's one more I want to throw back at you, which is uh, Clausewitz said, you know, that the principal trait of a, of a political leader really is distinguished intellect and strength of character. And he can always get the necessary military information one way or another. So uh, on that, I, I think that's a, a really critical observation. I mean, it does presume that that uh, individual of distinguished intellect and strength of character would seek out and be able to use military advice. Uh, but I, I think that um, I think that the idea of the emphasis on those two attributes is 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 pretty critical. So so we would have rather have relative, it's, it's easier to have a relatively expert boss, but I think the military ought to be prepared to serve uh, a curious, aggressive um, boss with maybe less specific military expertise. Um, Avi Nelson, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, the, the question I have is that you talk about educating the military in, in political matters. I can understand at the highest levels, that's important because you have to interact with the commander in chief, et cetera. But, excuse me. But I wonder whether once you get people involved in political matters, invariably they come to have a political viewpoint. And I wonder if you see any danger, if you have an officer corps that's involved politically, not only are the politics at the highest level changing from administration to administration, but you're going to have discussion at least and maybe dissension among the, the officers who have different political viewpoints. Is there a danger that that could spill over into a compromise of effectiveness in terms of the military operation, which has to be the paramount concern of such people? Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a, a terrific point. Um, and um, I think one of the reasons we tried to use the term political awareness is, you know, political awareness or political appreciation, uh, the idea of the significance of when charged to accomplish a military mission, um, having a deep understanding of the underlying purpose behind the specific actions or orders that were given in order to have a greater prospect of achieving the desired purpose. And we do feel, we did feel when we wrote this article and I do feel that it is, uh, first of all, uh, too late really once somebody as a colonel uh, and preparing to become a general to start to try to instill these kinds of, uh, this education and these instincts in part because uh, by that point, uh, those that are the most successful have been told how successful they are and they've been principally successful at, at very tactical jobs in the army, there's a very strong culture of the closer to troops you are, the better, and the more tactical the roles that you have, the higher prestige that they have. And so you don't by you don't by happenstance get the same officer that is highly regarded by the service that has the types of attributes that you would want them to have as, as senior leaders. So that was part of our uh, part of the way that I think about it. Another way of thinking about it is. You know, I, this was very much the case when we talked about counterinsurgency environments that really the political dominated the military. And uh, because it may not be the best course of action to do the tactically most effective thing if that had a political backlash that outweighed the benefit of that operation. So in counterinsurgency, I think we were already inclined to recognize that the political impact of the action outweighed assessments of sort of military tactical effectiveness. And then I think it's going to be increasingly the case that, um, you know, it depends a lot on the national security choices of our political leaders, but just to take something that we have been doing for a few years, uh, which is operations in Europe in order to reinforce, reaffirm NATO in the context of an aggressive Russia has meant uh, putting very small units of US uh, troops in the countries of our allies in Eastern Europe in order to do fundamentally political things like reaffirm uh, alliance, strengthen coalitions, uh, strengthen the perception of, of deterrence. And so fairly junior officers are involved in roles that do demand technical and tactical proficiency, but frankly also are uh, 
even more significantly political. Um, you know, if you're a, a, a junior officer in uh, Poland on an exercise deplo deployment, I mean, you, a, a US major might at a period of time be the most senior uh, officer in that country at, at a given period of time um, across Europe because we have a large, a very small number of forces doing a very large number of missions uh, in our in our allies. So, so I guess a two part answer. One is that I think because uh, the the military senior leaders comes from within the ranks and there's no lateral entry entry that if you want to have an, an attribute or a trait or knowledge in a senior military leader, you need to grow it throughout the career. And secondly, I think that our junior officers are um, are also in positions now where where they're, the political implications of what they do um, and having that deep awareness of the underlying rationale for their presence or for their actions can shape the way that they do things uh, so that it better advances the national interest. Um, Robert Faulkner, please. Bob, can you hear me? You're up. You got to unmute oh. yourself. Excellent. Um, hello, Colonel Nielsen. It's nice to nice to see you again. Very. Nice to uh, um, I have um, I have a kind of two part question, although it's already been addressed to some extent. Um, if there is a certain danger in 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 a a political outlook within the military. You've also indicated absolutely rightly, uh, as did Professor Rosen, uh, that there needs to be correction on the other side also, the political side. Do you have suggestions other than uh, the one that, that uh, Professor Rosen made as to how the political side can be strengthened in military matters? For example, should it be the case that the Secretary of Defense is, is a civilian in principle, or is that an artificial, too artificial a, a, a line? And the second part of the question is, you emphasize very much political education. What political education? It's, in my limited experience, it's very important that that our military force swear allegiance to the Constitution. That we we had some hints of the importance of that recently, but what kind of education is it that you would emphasize? Um, I, I think you've emphasized contemporary uh, a knowledge of kind of contemporary foreign affairs, but is that all? Especially if the if our military now is in such a powerful position. Yeah, thank you. I um, I really appreciate those questions, um, and obviously, for very good reasons, we're now talking about uh, whether or not the Secretary of Defense uh, should be a civilian, or whether um, it's appropriate for the role to be filled by, uh, you know, this would be the second time uh, in a very short period of time that uh, that an that an administration is seeking an exception to allow a, a retired four star take up the role of Secretary of Defense with less than seven years away from having been in uniform. I, I personally do think it's incredibly important that the Secretary of Defense uh, be a, a civilian person I, I, uh, with, no, um, with no disrespect toward uh, General Austin's uh, achievements uh, or character or identity. I, I do think the I do happen to fall among those uh, who believe that the Secretary of Defense should be a more fully civilian uh, actor. I, I, several colleagues uh, of ours um, just recently uh, put a think piece out yesterday that gave three fundamental reasons in terms of why, what we could think about when we think about that, uh, that particular role as a very strong manifestation of, of civilian of why that person might might be a civilian, and I pretty much agree with the, with the, with their reasons. One is it just reaffirms the principle of civilian control, which I think in our democratic system under the U.S. Constitution, in order to preserve a liberal democracy, uh, is a very important precedent to be very wary of 
of uh, damaging in any way. The second uh, point that they brought out, and I'll state it a little bit differently, is just that I think the job is fundamentally a political job. I mean, I think the the, the notion of the of the military expertise is not irrelevant to it. The Secretary of Defense is formally in the chain of command, but I think it's arguably a, a relatively small part of the expertise of the Secretary of Defense, and certainly not um, perhaps dispositionally. Um, you know, what I would imagine. One way of thinking about this is that the Secretary of Defense is a member of the president's cabinet. One of the president's uh, principal aides in implementing the president's policy agenda across the US government. So part of that role would be to help to, uh, to advocate for the president's national security policies with the Congress, with the American people, perhaps within the institution of the Department of Defense. To me, that's just one great example of how the Secretary of Defense is a political uh, figure uh, and not a technical uh, expert, first and foremost. Um, so I agree with that. And then I also, you know, the third point they made that I also agree with is just this idea that um, that it automatic that it it often flows back the divide between a current general and a former general is less significant than many might think. You know, once a, particularly at the rank of four star, once somebody's a four star general, it doesn't really matter whether they wear the uniform or not. They're gonna be treated for the rest of their lives, particularly by those in uniform or those who have been in uniform as if they are a general. Uh, and so the idea that then their activities um, beyond their time in uniform would reflect back on the services is I think a real uh, risk and challenge. And I think we've, had, we've seen on both sides of the aisle, some very strong examples of, uh, of retired general officers uh, taking extremely partisan roles. Um, and I don't think that that is really help, healthy for um, the norms within the military institution, but particularly for the American public's understanding of the role of the military in our, our society. So, um, so I, I um, I do think it's very important to strengthen the political side. I would uh, love to see additional investments across higher education and uh, military and strategic understanding. Um, but I also think that it's gonna be a diverse, uh, di diffuse population. And um, so what can be the mechanisms to develop a cadre of people that are relatively no uh, knowledgeable? I think those all deserve to be thought about. Um, when you say what political education, um, it's a really wonderful point. I mean, I think first and foremost, uh, I do think that um, a deep appreciation for the characteristics of American government is very important uh, in a military officer who want, who is uh, assigned to serve that government. So an understanding of formal institution, I mean, these are, these are things that I, I just, you know, I would have liked to, we would like to take for granted that out of high school, uh, young people understand uh, how the government is structured, what the constitution says, uh, what, what our system rests on in terms of not only formal, uh, uh, formal laws and powers, but also informal norms. Uh, but I don't think that's the case. And so I do think it's, it's really important for, uh, particularly for those who want to serve the government to understand it well, to understand uh, and of course, we're fortunate here at the Academy, every cadet gets a course in American government. And we have found over the years that we uh, have content in that course that uh, is closer to civics uh, than we may have had 10, 20 years ago because, the, because the, there's a lack of understanding and that's a foundation and they need to have that first. So more content on formal institutions and on the, on the content, formal and informal actors, processes, uh, but I also think, um, and I really think that's among the most important things uh, because it sets the stage for uh, understanding one's role in helping policymakers who have the legitimate authority and responsibility to make the difficult value trade-off calls that are associated with making policy, you know, how to just have the right context and frame for all those issues. That being said, I do think also though in, in, in you know, the American people invest an awful lot in their military and the military has a very extensive system of, of ongoing professional education. And it would uh, be appropriate that that includes a broad appreciation of 
uh, the fact that military power is an instrument of power among instruments of power. It's best wielded in conjunction, uh, an appreciation of the types of things that, um, that plague, but also can uh, be the fruits of effective interagency cl collaboration. So I think um, strategic and some international political understanding is also really important to set the context and to help uh, military be advisors. But, um, but I would really start with an emphasis on a deep appreciation for the nature of the American political system and an understanding of the, of the role of the, of the US military in it. Um, Ethan Orwin and then Adam White, please. Uh, Colonel Nielsen, it's good Ethan, to see it's you good after, to see you again. After a number of years, I certainly <laughs> fondly remember uh, your international relations class and, and mentorship during my time at, at West Point back back when you were Major Nielsen. Um, you don't seem to be as da uh, terribly damaged. I'm really glad to see that. Well, it's mostly psychological. Um, <laughs> uh, so, ma'am, you you uh, in your discussion of Huntington, uh, you know, you mentioned America's liberal democracy. And I think you implied that that liberal democracy that we all cherish um, can pose some challenges to um, developing and, and, and running an effective national security apparatus. And I think we've seen that in recent years, especially in comparison to some of our adversaries. Um, you look at the Russians, you know, after the 2008 Georgia war, they could basically convene the national security leadership, say, look, we had these shortcomings. We need to cut this one third of our military and invest in this and this, right? And it just happens immediately. There's no congressman who's going to lobby to hold up the closure of a tank factory in his district. You know, there's no long bureaucratic, or that is to say, democratic process, which d delays or makes it harder to implement the changes you need to implement and, and, and so on. Um, so I, I guess my question is, what in the realm of civil military relations can be done to mitigate those those difficulties that democracy and bureaucracy you know impose on on the sort of senior level decisions that we need to make both on the military and civilian side as we have administrations come and go that sometimes lurch back and forth between policies you know both both foreign and domestic and the military which takes a long time to change anything rushes to change in order to respond to you know a new administration's policy and then four years later those changes are just beginning to come to fruition and a new policy comes in and we have to lurch again you know what can we do on the military side or the civilian side to to mitigate the difficulty i i just described yeah you know that's an interesting question ethan you know a couple things come to mind um you know one is dr risa brooks is i think uh written some interesting things lately. One observation she has about uh, Samuel Huntington's work in terms of, you know, and, and let me just say that I have, um, you know, Hugh and I say in the paper, and it's, I really believe that the work has done more harm, more good than harm, and that there's so many incredible, uh, helpful conceptual tools in there. But one of the things Risa has said about it is that a, a two, um, if you're infused with the ideas in that book that, that military people may be too inclined to oversimplify this, the political um, military relationship such that they approach the necessary and important dialogues between political purpose and military means in an overly simplistic fashion. And when it doesn't meet their expectations, they are cynical and disgusted. So, uh, you know, a really simplistic uh, way of thinking about it is the political leaders uh, set the political purpose and they set a very clear political goal uh, and they have a clear sense in their mind about what they're willing to, to pay to achieve that, what risks they're willing to run and the costs and benefits that are acceptable to them. And then the military just takes that clearly stated political intent and figures out how to, how to implement it, how to craft you know, means in such a way that that will be coherently executed. And frankly, I think that probably anyone who's ever served at higher level in government is just knows that that's not gonna be the case. Political leaders may not have enough information and they certainly don't have the incentives to make those sort of bold one-time, very clear calls about uh, political objectives. Uh, they're gonna be trying to feel their way. And uh, military leaders, I think need to be 
prepared to be part of that objective, uh, full of shades of gray, ambiguity, dynamic process with political leaders in a very robust ongoing dialogue in which civilians get the last word. So I think part of it might be, and this doesn't fully get it, the answer to your question, um, which is sort of about the relative merits of autocracy and democracy that <laughs> maybe there's more people better in this call that might better uh, dive into that one than, than I. But, um, but I think that would be the first thing I would say is that I think uh, sophistication about the true nature of uh, strategic decision making, policy making, the dialogue that's required, a set of reasonable expectations about what they're likely to get, and a recognition that their their goal is to serve a process that as as coherent as possible while being democratically appropriate is the right set of explanation explanations. I also think in the military's realm, you know, the, the military itself has not always been perfect. So. You know, I appreciated the, um, Steve Rosen's willingness to let the military off the hook in Iraq, but I think that even at the operational level, you could look across the years of the U.S. intervention in Iraq and see uh, years in which there was not a coherent campaign plan um, that was uh, executed by the brigades across Iraq and different brigades in the same sectors over time in a consistent way. And it's really hard to put the pin the rose on anybody except the military for um, for coherence at that level. Uh, so um, the, the, I think that the larger issue you're raising, I don't think the American government has ever fully solved, which is who does long-term coherent strategic planning uh, on behalf of the US government? Um, maybe it's been in the White House for brief moments, like maybe in the Eisenhower administration, maybe policy planning in state for brief moments when that's been a particularly powerful office. I think DOD is always likely to be a problematic home because the DOD is going to focus on military instruments of power. So I do think that that's a, a large challenge for the US government that hasn't been tackled. Uh, I think the military has an obligation to be a constructive player in that process uh, wherever it, it fundamentally rests. So it's not a full answer, Ethan, but that those are some of the thoughts provoked by, by that observation. And it is good to see you again. <laughs> Adam, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, for this interesting talk and, and fascinating paper. Um, I, I'm a novice to all these issues, and so I found it fascinating. But I'm thinking sort of beyond the normal context of, of these debates, it seems to me, as I understand it, we're talking about the relationship between soldiers and the part of government at the federal government that's focused on uh, national security uh, and the chain of command. And so I just wanted to poke a little bit of the limits of this analysis. I'm curious, um, would it be good to look at things slightly differently for the non-military parts of government? Might it not be good to actually encourage greater involvement by, by, by veterans uh, in the, the other parts of the federal government where their qualities of character and citizenship might, might really benefit uh, the government without the the, 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 the sort of conflicts that are present in the, the national security context. And then I guess maybe looking slightly further afield, what about in Congress, uh, either as members of Congress or uh, as staff on military and non-military issues? And, and finally, might it not be good to encourage greater political involvement by veterans at the state and local level where there's really no national security issues and those parts of government might really benefit from the qualities of character and marks of citizenship that uh, veterans uh, you know, bear to an extraordinary degree. Thank you. Uh, no, I appreciate that, that comment. Um, you know, I would, I would hope that um, in part what military leaders have to offer perhaps after a career in uniform, um, again, uh, largely invested in by the American people uh, as they go through professional military education and just have some unique opportunities to, to lead and to serve. Hopefully, the, uh, they do have some attributes that one might imagine could contribute in a variety of different different ways. And I think your mention of the federal bureaucracy is a good one. I, you know, there was a time when retired military officer to go back and work for the government would have to give up their military uh, retirement for the period that they were in the federal government, and that is that is no longer the case. So the disincentive uh, against a veteran serving elsewhere in the federal government uh, no longer exists. And so I would hope that those 
uh, that where there is the right talent match, that that um, that the U.S. Would, the United States would continue to, to bear the the benefit of uh, the investments it's, it's made in its military after these people leave uniform and if they uh, uh, choose to serve in the federal government. Um, you know, in terms of the veterans in, in Congress, there are, I, I, again, I, um, I think the, the part, the only part about that that, I, that I've not, never been completely convinced by is this notion that somebody who's once wore the uniform inevitably makes uh, smarter national security decisions in the sense that there's a variety of levels and, and, char and characteristics of service such that, you know, depending on, on the years of service um, and the types of levels and experiences that an individual has had, uh, they, they may not necessarily have broader uh, political, military, or strategic experience such that the types of decisions a congressman would have are informed by uh, a few years in uniform. You know, that being said, I, I don't, um, I guess I would really wanna know the, 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 the individual's broader set of characteristics rather than just veteran status, I guess is where it comes down to me in terms of thinking of them as an elected member in the House or the Senate. And state and local government, I guess I would think the same way that I think about, about the federal bureaucracy and that if, uh, if there are attributes, there's training, there's organizational leadership experience, administrative experience that can contribute uh, to, the, to the public good in those uh, public service positions, then you know I, I would uh, I would have no hesitation about you know being glad to see that or about the um, I don't necessarily see a downside. Thank you, um, Martha and David Martini, please, and then Shep Melnick. Thank you, uh, Colonel Nielsen, for that uh, very interesting presentation and for your paper. Uh, I, I just have a short intervention, I guess, or response, and it's partly an answer to something Professor Faulkner said. He wanted to know specifically what was taught. And then in the course of your remarks, you've mentioned how important what is taught can sometimes be for the uh, for the uh, uh, for the military at whatever at whatever level. And um, Secretary of State Pompeo has spoken movingly uh, about his introduction to the Federalist uh, at West Point, um, such that uh, for once he was deployed, he carried that book in his rucksack. Now, this at that he was not a general or and and I don't imagine that that book was at that time, inspiring him to go one way or the other politically, but it certainly was a significant inspiration for his service because he had a sense that he was, um, he was fighting for and on behalf of something high and wonderful and worthy of his efforts. And so that's all I'm going to say. No need to respond, it was just an example. No, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I do think that, um, you know, the mission of the military academy is to educate, train, and inspire. And I don't think that there's any doubt that we um, that we have that goal. Uh, and it's it's uh, you know wonderful to have an a, an a, a example recounted in which that that effect was achieved. Thank you. Chef, please. Thank you. Um, like Adam, I'm a novice of these things, so I really appreciated your talk. Um, and I'd like to invite you to say a little bit more in response both to Bob's question and Martha's comment, which is beyond the way you teach in the current course, um, what do you think that everyone who serves as a senior military leader should have read? What recommendations would you have? Um, and I, I guess I'd go a little bit beyond that. Um, having sat through far too many comprehensive exams where one of the subjects is international relations. I'm struck by the extent to which in political science these days, international relations is really kept quite separate from other parts of studying American politics. Um, 
And there's, there aren't many people like Sam Huntington anymore who really um, know a lot about political theory, American politics, comparative politics. Of course, Steve is one exception to that general rule and Elliot Cohen is another. But is, is political science in some ways not producing the, the um, analysis um, that combines necessarily all these aspects of politics that you think that our military leaders and Steve really wants our civilian leaders to understand? Yeah, that's, that's a great challenge. I think, uh, I think that's a great challenge for all of us who would like to call ourselves political scientists is uh, one of the great questions is, uh, you know, what, what does uh, political science contribute to politics? Uh, and I, I know, I think there's a lot of professional incentives in political science to uh, to publish in the top professional journals by uh, finding the, the the relatively narrow area in which one can advance knowledge uh, that's publishable, or the methodological twist uh, that is not yet been employed effectively to address a political problem, rather than getting at some of the, the central uh, the challenges that face our society, our polity. Um, our pursuit of, of security. So I, I do think it's a really serious challenge uh, that um, certainly I've reflect, reflected on. I, I suspect many of us have reflected on how do scholars contribute to, um, to, to the quality of our political life. Um, you know, I, I'm probably not very well prepared to talk about which books. I'm going to say a little bit about issues though, I think uh, one, one good example of something that I think that um, is an issue that is rooted in the fundamentals of our constitutional system that is not as often not naturally appreciated in senior military leaders is really the incredibly significant role of our Congress, which is at least a co-equal branch of government when it comes to military affairs. You know, as you grow up in uniform, uh, you, spend your life walking through headquarters in which there's the chain of command, you know, and the pictures are on the wall and it runs only through the executive branch. But fundamentally, the, the powers of the Congress are at least as significant. Uh, and the obligations of senior military leaders to Congress are not derivative of their obligations to the president. They are distinct and separate. And in fact, I think this was uh, Samuel Huntington's condemnation of the structure that Reimer set up in terms of how it could tend to, to pull uh, senior military leaders into politics because it's sort of inevitable when you answer to two masters, the, the president as well as Congress. But I think a sort of sophisticated appreciation about the role of, of Congress, uh, the importance, um, they have the, you know, the, the enumerated powers in the Constitution, certainly the power of the purse, the power of oversight, um, the power to declare war. Um, so I, I do think that that is, is one issue, is a great appreciation uh, for that. And then the care with which that uh, those conflicting loyalties, on the one hand, being loyal to the president and the commander in chief, on the other hand, respecting the constitutional prerogatives of the Congress, how there can be tension there, how to navigate that, that kind of um, social and empathetic wisdom, as well as just simply political expertise, I think is an area um, that may not be um, as, as commonly appreciated uh, as it should be. And I, you know, I'd be the first to admit our, our Congress does not always uh, present a lovable face to the world. And I think you <laughs> find that in the public trust numbers uh, from places like the PU polls, but that doesn't uh, change the constitutional prerogatives. Um, you know, I do think uh, even as a political scientist, if it's okay for me to say this, there's just a lot to be gained from deep appreciation of history, uh, understanding uh, the relationship of, uh, of the role of the US uh, military institutions within our republic over time and uh, what those have, what the relationships have been like in terms of having some uh, sense, sense of perspective about current crises uh, and challenges uh, might also be uh, helpful. Um, but yeah, I, I think that was a great challenge and I'll take that on board to think about what would the, the reading list look like. 
Um, I have a question too. I'm way out of my depth here. I read your paper, but you know, this is all new to me. But so things that are helpful to me are when you speak about concrete examples, like you say, you know, brigades in the Iraq war were on the, the, the strategies were incongruent or, or, um, you know, why it's problematic to have a general as or an ex general as um, Secretary of, St of Defense. Um, can you give people like me some more concrete examples of what could have been done better um, in light of uh, what, what you're emphasizing and wishing to improve um, in recent military operations, something concrete, something I can like, you know, retain more easily and maybe some counterfactuals even of what, what could have gone better and what, what will be better if, um, if what you um, would like to um, will be implemented. No, thank you for that. Um, let me take a stab and there may be someone in the room that um, in our virtual room that could uh, add nuance to this, but um, to me, something that I think that we, that I don't know when we'll ever see the definitive work on it. Uh, and certainly um, it remains difficult for me to understand how the United States decided to invade Iraq in the way that it did in 2003. Um, I do not know uh, that there was a clear sense across the Bush administration of what the goal was. Um, certainly, if the goal was to foster democracy in Iraq, then the invasion force could not have looked like what it looked like, because that was a, a force that was sized to topple a government rather than a force sized to fundamentally transform that society in some kind of a social revolution that would, would uh, leave a liberal democracy in its place. So what is the role of the military in that? Uh, what, were, what was the strength of the dialogue? What was the, certainly the political leaders have the responsibility, the authority, have the value judgment uh, to make the trade-off decisions and, and decide what's worth a life. You know, that's the, the president's call, but the, the effort to be a constructive partner, uh, to push the question of, of what, how do you want this to look once we're through? And, and what's next? What's the next step such that you wouldn't necessarily take the first step, you know, Clausewitz again, never take the first step without knowing where you intend to end up at the end. Uh, could a better civil military dialogue have pushed that point? I think there's some evidence to suggest that there was a deliberate narrowing of the decision-making under Secretary Rumsfeld in the DOD to prevent voices from mucking up the works with by posing hard challenges that weren't easily addressed that would slow down uh, the, the actual US invasion uh, of Iraq. And um, to, the, to the extent that uh, military leaders felt that they only had such a constrained set of obligations that it was okay that that was happening. Um, you know, I think the CENTCOM commander, for example, has come in for some um, merited criticism. Uh, there is a, um, you know, there's a famous episode where the army chief of staff before Congress was asked, you know, what do you think would be the force president necessary to secure Iraq after the invasion? And he said several hundred thousand uh, in open hearing and was, was promptly uh, vilified. Um, you know, that was not an ideal venue to have that discussion. It, ideally, it would be happening simultaneously within the executive branch. The, the idea that it wasn't happening within the executive branch um, is problematic. So, um, you know, as I say all this, I, I don't want to call into question the sense that the military is always subordinate in these dialogues, but I do not want to underestimate either the power of the military to, to, um, to make sure that the decisions are fully considered. You know, that um, what I see that you're asking us to do is this, what I see as the costs and risks are this. Uh, is that what you believe that you're asking me to do? Um, I think those are the important um, junior partner in the dialogue kinds of questions that I think there's some evidence that didn't happen as in as robust of a way in the White House and in the DOD at the early stages of the Iraq war as they should. So that would be an example that I would give. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question uh, also, uh, Suzanne. Um, uh, what, what is uh, uh, the military mind? And um, I want to give a couple of aspects of it and compare it to what, what, what one might call the democratic mind. Uh, in, in, because some people think that the military is in some ways essentially opposed to democracy. And maybe there's some truth in that. And, uh, and the military uh, is able to address weaknesses that are in democracy. We could turn it around. But the two things I'm thinking of is first, uh, um, the orderliness of the military. When I, when I first entered uh, the army as an enlisted man in my two year stint, I was drafted a long time ago <laughs> when there was still a draft. And I remember one of the things that the, uh, the first sergeant I encountered uh, stressed, and that was, uh, the one, he likes to see things squared away. When he enters a barracks, he wants to see everything in line. Nothing is, uh, is odd or out of place or slightly uh, adrift or not where it should be exactly. So, the, and this is a great orderliness in the military mind, which uh, is, it seems um, quite different or even opposed to the sense of democratic individuality where it's good to be different and, um, and to stand out or uh, be odd or eccentric and all these things are part of freedom and freedom means living as you please, not in an orderly fashion. So that would be one point. And then the other is um, that uh, it strikes me that, that the military mind is uh, always occupied with something uh, maybe abstract, but uh, usually not so abstract, which is called the enemy. There is an enemy and th that is what we're facing and what we have to address and defend ourselves against. Um, whereas uh, democracy is uncomfortable with the idea that uh, that war is a necessary feature of human life. And it's uh, democracy likes to be peaceable in its intentions and um, doesn't like to go to war. Although once it gets into war, it can uh, be very enthusiastic indeed. So um, orderliness and the enemy. Are, are those two things which the military mind uh, can contribute to democracy? That would be my question. No, I, I appreciate that. I, I think that, um, you know, one of the ways that I've thought about that is that I think that there are things uh, that are practices within the military uh, by, by law, by regulation, by custom, that are, are part of what Samuel Huntington would have called the functional imperative. So for example, a greater emphasis on obedience uh, than one might find in society writ large. And you just gave another great example, the greater example on orderliness. You know, one of the changes in the last year here at West Point is that when I was a cadet, every drawer, the items in that drawer, not only were folded in a specific way, but they were in a specific exact location in the drawer. Uh, you know, your socks had the smile and your t-shirts, you didn't see any of the folds as you opened the drawer because of the way that it looked. Uh, and that was actually just reintroduced this year to the Corps of Cadets in a, uh, in a it was fairly shocking to them. It was uh, separate from their worldview. But I think that that part of the, that these things are not uh, incompatible with uh, recognizing that some of the emphasis on issues like that are for very functional and important arena, uh, reasons in terms of what makes military organizations effective when they are uh, facing the toughest trials. Uh, you need to know where all your equipment is when you're under fire. Uh, you need to, um, you know, a, a 
so those you know those are some of the sort of extreme examples but uh and and frankly you know you're over a drop zone the green the light goes green the jumper needs to jump out the door and it's not time for debate you know green light go and that's that kind of emphasis on the functional reasons for some of the values that are in the military like obedience and orderliness but i think that it would be possible for a democratically minded military to recognize the functional value in those attributes of the military organization and frankly to even take pride in them without necessarily presuming that the embrace of those values makes the military superior to the broader society that one could simultaneously value uh, orderliness for what it does to military effectiveness and treasure the fact that American citizens, that's not the first value, that that's, that, that's a diverse, uh, colorful country where the practices range uh, widely and there's great initiative and innovation and ingenuity and creativity uh, in the broader society and that, um, and that we could that those differences again are are related to the function of the organization rather than a necessary superiority of the military uh, to the broader society. I think you know what your question got at was um, could some of those attributes of the military have utility in the broader society? And I, I think it's I mean that was sort of the premise of where some Samuel Huntington ends the soldier in the state. But I, I would have to say uh, that it that there that there might be uh, activities or sectors or problems in which uh, the military's approaches to problems or the military's talent for organizing itself or getting a large number of people to do something as a team could come in handy to American society. But I would uh, personally not be comfortable with the idea that those attributes are are um, anything but at the service of the society, uh, that they're developed and fostered because they're functional in defending that, that society of, of which the military is a part. Uh, so that's sort of where I, I come down on, on that one. Um, in terms of the focus on the enemy, um, you know, I, I do think that there is a, uh, there is a potentially unforgiving aspect of the military ethic. You know, when I was a, a new cadet again, I guess because I'm sitting here at West Point, I'm tempted to tell these stories. But you know, you had three responses to questions from upper class, and they were yes sir, no sir, or no excuse. You know, sir or ma'am, depending on who you were talking to. And the no excuse part is not uh, broadly characteristic of the of the broader society, but it sort of gets to the potentially absolutist nature of military activity. Uh, you are there when you're needed or you are not. And because the consequences are potentially violent, that's, you can't undo that. I mean, there's not, you can't rationalize it away. It's not okay that you didn't make it. Uh, it just, it happened or it didn't. Um, I think that that is, um, um, th that that is reflects some aspects of the culture that relate to the type of mission that envisions doing so under fire against an enemy. Um, but I also think that, um, that it's possible that in a focus on the, on the enemy alone um, is in some ways not a broad enough conception of what the military owes the country. You know, the army is uh, 1.2 million people and it's active, it's reserve, it's national guard, it's active duty. It includes the Army Corps of Engineers as well as uh, war fighting infantry squads. You know, the Army exists to advance the national purpose. And that can involve the crucible of combat. It, it can involve uh, hur hurricane relief. Uh, it can involve uh, civil order, which is a mission obviously that, that I think the military least likes. Uh, uh, so I, I think a, an intensity on mission accomplishment and the preparedness to do so under the most extreme conditions is something that is functional for the military to develop. Um, but I, you know, I don't, uh, and I guess there is a presumption that in society as it is, uh, armed conflict is always possible. We may not want to always look that in the face as just citizens of a, of a democratic society. Uh, but I, um, I don't know, um, 
I guess in that one, I, I don't, I, I'm uh, not sure what it might say about anything that the military would have to say to the broader society, except for the occasional need to consider being willing to pull together for the common good. Um, I don't know. I feel that that was a very unsatisfactory answer. Perhaps I'm envisioning myself being back in my comprehensives, <laughs> exams, which is uh, scarily at this point, 21 years ago. I really appreciate you defending the state of my linen closet, for instance. Like I could call it the military, but um, no, see, Harpy, that serves its function. Thank you. Um, Andy Zwick, please, and then Alex Orwin. Thank you very much for your talk and for um, your and Hugh's paper. I wanted to follow up on Anna's question and ask for concrete examples in our contemporary political and military history about the collaboration between various secretaries of defense and uh, the leadership of the military. So uh, for example, the ones you think have been most successful in the character of them and the ones you think you know, have been least successful. So whether we're talking about Robert McNamara or Dick Cheney or William Cohen um, or Donald Rumsfeld um, in terms of the leadership from uh, the Office of Secretary of Defense and the various collaborations within senior military leadership. Uh, so that's my question. No, I, I appreciate that. I, I think the, the one that right now uh, in my own mind, I think is, um, you know, it's interesting. And it, as a national security advisor, it's a really quick answer. Brent Scowcroft did it right and everybody else is second best. Um, I don't have quite as clear of an answer on Secretary of Defense, but I, I think the one that I, that I, that I, that first jumps to mind is is Secretary Gates, uh, and I, for for several reasons, I think he um, there were some things about the job I think he really appreciated in the sense that um, uh, that he um, you know had a had respect for the military, but also fully appreciated that he was in charge and that it was uh, up to him to sort of be the the. I think he was between uh, the president and the the senior military leadership as he should have been. Uh, I think he was very respectful of the military, but I also think that he was willing to hold the military accountable. I think he was willing to make tough decisions. Uh, he was willing to relieve four-star commanders in theaters of war when he felt it was appropriate. He was willing to relieve the commander of Walter Reed uh, when it was appropriate. Um, you know, I, the DOD is such a monstrous mammoth enterprise. It's so difficult to change the bureaucratic uh, direction of it. But I think he was also uh, astute enough to appreciate the importance of both the president and Congress as constituencies. And to the extent that a, a secretary of defense managed to change the investment portfolio of the Department of Defense, uh, Secretary Gates uh, was able to do that. Um, again, an, it's like an aircraft carrier. I think nothing turns at 90 degrees, uh, but he was able to put an imprint on it uh, for reasons that he that were strategically derived and navigate the politics of it. Uh, so I, um, I have respect for his leadership. I guess the other thing I would say about that is um, it's hard for me to imagine another Secretary of, Gate, uh, Secretary of Defense who would advocate so uh, enthusiastically and effectively for, for well, maybe I shouldn't say effectively because investment really hasn't changed, but for the importance of other instruments of power, you know, Secretary Gates, uh, and, and it's reflected in his most recent book, Exercise of Power, the recognition that the United States tends to uh, turn to the military instrument because the United States, in part because the U.S. is invested in that instrument and whether or not, and, and there are weaknesses in the way that uh, the United States is, has 
has really conducted what he calls a symph symphony of instruments of power to include information, diplomacy, economic tools, as well as military tools to achieve the national interest. And as Secretary of Defense, he saw that. And as Secretary of Defense, he advocated for uh, an, approved, uh, an approved ability to orchestrate that symphony uh, of the interagency and of different tools of power. So, so that's the one that comes to mind. Thank you. Alex, please. Oh. oh, hello. Okay, I'll I'll try to contribute to this in the only way I can. Like so many people here, I can talk about the reading list. Uh, so, Ch Churchill, right, is of some interest. And one thing in particular that uh, your talk reminded me of this article called uh, "Ludendorff's All or Nothing" about the end of uh, World War One and how Germany brought disaster on itself by thinking only of military options and not assessing the political situation, in effect, by being obsessed with military victory. Um, so it's quite a fascinating account of this man who's not well known today, at least not to me, Ludendorff, who was in charge of Germany at the time, and how his um, preference for military considerations over political ones you know, led the country to complete disaster. Like he could have made peace, but instead he engaged in unrestricted submarine warfare and you know, eventually right, leading to this uh, complete defeat in 1917. Um, so I, I think that would be interesting to bring to this discussion anyway. Yeah, I appreciate that reference. Steve, please. Th thank you for calling me on again. Uh, and I, I'm motivated to ask my, this question by Harvard's mentioned that you might be interested in talking about uh, current teaching at West Point. Uh, for many years, you were teaching cadets who knew that after uh, being commissioned, they would be sent into a theater of war in the Middle East. Uh, and that had problems and that had advantages. And now you're teaching cadets who are leaving, but it's much less clear what they as army officers will be doing to contribute to the national security of the United States. What's it, what, was it, what are the differences in teaching cadets who are going to go off to fight in the war versus teaching students who are going off to become officers in a struggle in a, uh, in a perhaps a new form of cold war. Uh, how do you address your, the way in which you interact with them? How are they different? Because they face a future which is very different from what people graduating in the aughts were facing. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I've actually, ne I never really answered this question very well. Uh, the cadets just get younger to me, regardless of what's going on in the world uh, every year. Um, <laughs> I do think that there was well, a, welcome to the welcome to the country. Okay. <laughs> I do think there was a bit of of a heightened tension between, in some what some call the dual identity of West Point, the sort of Athens and Sparta, the educational mission and the direct military training mission when it was the case that a much higher percentage of our lieutenants would be, our graduates would be, be lieutenants in, in combat within the year uh, after they graduated. So there was the tendency to pull some of the, of the training uh, type activities, uh, potentially at the expense of education, uh, deeper into the curriculum here at West Point, um, heightened our never ending fight over time I would say if there's any resource at West Point that we will fight over, it will be who has what claim on what hour of cadets time. Uh, can we claim it for studying and learning? Can, can we claim it for physical activity? Is it claimed by uh, something else? So I think that that tension is a little bit um, less. I think, I think that in some ways though, we have a, I think at least in my, I think at the academy, we have a sense of modesty about 
how much we know about what the cadets specific challenges are going to be. And I think that the way we think about this is that we just hope that the what we still see as the strengths of a broad liberal uh, liberal arts education in which our cadets get a very robust uh, grounding in physical sciences, in mathematics, in uh, and the humanities and social sciences, as well as some degree of study in depth in a, in a topic prepares them to uh, to tackle the, the challenges that they may face that we can't possibly foresee right now. So in some ways, I think our curriculum and what we do uh, to try to prepare the cadets uh, changes a little bit less than uh, than, than an outsider might think. Uh, and it changes, frankly, a little bit less than the cadets might think. The cadets, uh, not having experienced uh, the Iraq war in, the Af in Afghanistan, they, they think that the entire army was refocused on counterinsurgency, which is frankly completely untrue, certainly not true of the investment portfolio. Um, uh, and similarly, now they all think that the future is great power conflict, because that's what the defense strategy says. Uh, and it's not as clear that, that that's true either. So what, what kinds of habits of thought and uh, knowledge can we give them that will equip them to, uh, whatever, however those cha challenges manifest themselves to address them? Um, I see Hugh, uh, and Hugh, you made, you, uh, you're, yeah. I can now see you on the screen. Do you, do you wanna <laughs> add to this? That'd be great oh, yeah, to hear your thoughts. Jump in. You know, since we're sharing stories about teaching at West Point, I thought I might share one, which is that, you know, I have the same sense of, of you know, the kind of cadets' concerns and our goal in teaching being more perennial than, um, than changing to adjust to, you know, the conditions and security and all that. But um, one of my first and, and most memorable experiences here, you know, I started in 2011, was um, the cadets on the night when they found out where they got to go, like what post they got to go to, you know, they'd already found out their branch, but they were doing post. Um, just seeing them walk up and down the, the hallways of Lincoln Hall, where we all have our offices, trying to see, find an officer, uh, you know, a junior military officer, a uh, professor who had seen the patch chart in the Pentagon, so knew which units were going next, you know, to, to be deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan. And the sentiment among them was, was that they, they were worried the war was about to end, you know, and they wanted to make sure that they got in, you know, before, before it was done. Um, and I'll tell you like that, like that sense of, of like things are going to wrap up and I have to get in now, like is, is, has been persistent in the students by and large I talked to. I mean, you know, how they envision where they want to go changes, you know, like the, the act of conflict might be like cyber or might be great power or something like that. But the sense of like, you know, that's, that's the next thing. And, you know, that seems pretty constant, at least in the period that I've been here. Um, before I wrap up, let me just uh, say that Alex Orwin, thank you for that recommendation. Um, I know that piece by Churchill very well, and we should absolutely have included it in the article. I don't know why it didn't occur to me to do that, but <laughs> that's a wonderful uh, example of the sort of thing I think that uh, the Sin and I were trying to get after in that piece. Let's give the last question to Joshua King. Carl Nielsen uh, and Dr. Lieber, thanks for your papers. I really enjoyed it. Um, Colonel Nielsen, part of your ar argument, as best I understood it, was that the Army remains nonpartisan by serving three things, American interests, American purpose, and a common good. Is there agreement on those three things? It seems to me that those are the three things that are most contested in American politics right now, purpose, uh, the existence of a common good, and what our interests are. And if those things are hotly contested, in what sense can the army remain nonpartisan if it has to pick a definition? Thanks. Yeah, Josh, I, uh, I think I, I'm more agreeing with you than feel challenged by you. I, I don't uh, actually think that, that the determination of those things that, first of all, there's any such thing as a clean determination of those things ever, that's, that's, uh, that they're anything other than a source of ongoing debate in our polity and that the responsibility for uh, determining what they mean on behalf of the society in our system of government, the legitimacy to make that choice is conferred through uh, having been elected. So I, I don't at all think that the military has a role in coming to independent judgments on those issues. Um, and oh, by the way, it's not fair to have another question come from Lincoln Hall. Can I have well, another thanks. response coming from Lincoln Hall before we wrap up? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, uh, you say something. You want to you want to contribute? Yeah, well, no, just to cite uh, one of Harvey's earlier works, you know, about America's constitutional soul. Like, I feel like there is, you know, in the 
a kind of constitutional soul in the in the the, the military where you know there is not a determination you know at its best anyway not a determination of what the common good is but a real commitment to the the institutions you know the mechanisms of structuring the debate and coming to some kind of you know provisional conclusion about that um so that's what i want to say good well thank you so much thank you so much suzanne colonel nielsen uh, this is a wonderful talk and it's been great to be with you again and good luck tomorrow uh, thank you so much, Harvey, Annie, and everybody for taking the time today. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Susan. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, bye.